section 25 yeah. listed in the section on revitalizing public education systems in India. Okay. Whether my topic of bridge of change of ancient education systems in Sri Lanka really fits into this theme. But what's big irrigation scheme, massive irrigation schemes in India, and these are small scale irrigation schemes in, uh, in Sri Lanka. But when I listened to the Trusha's presentation, I mean, he talked about uh, the need for uh, uh, his, not, he had his three boxes, I can't remember. So, you know, if you don't focus on one segment, you focus on several components of the education system and that you need to change there. And also listening to Vishwa who said, you know, 40 years of reform has not worked. Shima says you have, you know, your capacity to the irrigation fees of, uh, and, and, and joy. I was also saying I'm collecting irrigation fees and still nothing is happening. She says, no, with all these reforms, then you have the tail end problem still there. And what Timothaya said, the dry crop has become the wet crop and the wet crop has become the dry crop. So all these things change, suggest that what is happening in our effort to rehabilitate or revitalize education systems, we are taking a piecemeal approach. We reform something here, we set up what is associated here, Conduct water phase here, do some rehabilitation there, even within the same system. So these piecemeal approaches have failed, and that is very clear. And so, whereas when we see what I'm talk, going to talk about is some of the examples that I, uh, I see in these small scale systems where there is a no piecemeal effort, but a more holistic total effort which has revived or revitalized irrigation systems which were once in a state of, uh, which were uh, dilapidated. I guess I still have 15 minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so this is my presentation of how can the lessons that we have learned from these small scale systems be replicated or be useful to the um, um, really effort to revitalize major schemes. And you may know that whatever, even some of the, some of the major reform programs in the major schemes really were drawn based on lessons that were from taken from the small scale system. PIM for instance. PIM is based on farmer managed irrigation systems. The replication, so replicated there and it worked with the farmer managed irrigation system that was now transformed into the larger system. Similarly, the work on gender which Margaret initiated in the Chattisgarh and small scale uh, the hill irrigation system from Nepal, that became over the years make a bigger program on water and gender issues in, 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 for gender and irrigation issues. So whatever lessons we draw from the small scale system has indeed less, has in, important lessons for the larger system. So it is in that context I think my my what I felt that was that this uh, topic on the changes that we had seen in the small scale system has what it has to do with the large scale system. Kusha alluded to one of the changes. One of the changes is the how you. Um, reactivated or empowered the water use associated with PIM to, to channeling the fertilizer subsidy. But then there were other changes that occurred spontaneously. And that spontaneously, I would sort of argue, is that spontaneously they were able to do that because the small scale systems were able, have the uh, ability to adapt to change, which I know that I will argue out that is not seen or not allowed or not cannot be done on the major scale. So anyway, the small scale system in Sri Lanka is, uh, you know, is a valuable asset. Numbers differ. It's a large, there are about 48,000 schemes, and uh, okay, about 140,000 to uh, 177 hectares, is by, quoted by different agencies. And of course, we have the education system contributing to about 27% of the national rice production. Now, in Sri Lanka, Ancient hydraulic civilization, that have been very well known nationally, is centered around this irrigation, which were again, there were some major scale. Our major systems are medium or small scale by Indian standard, but they are major systems, and then we have the small scale village tank systems. And the feature, like in Tamil Nadu, they are all uh, cascade of systems, interlinked in various ways, either in parallel uh, along the waterway or water courses. Thirdly, they are all based on traditional irrigation systems that was developed over centuries and of course in many of these are even uh, seen even today. 
that, but over time, like in the scale, these systems decline, in trapping farmers in a kind of vicious cycle of poverty, food security, and their farmers had few incentives to change. But all that changed from about 1990s, when there was a kind of later a late entry uh, to look for this pressure pump uh, that actually in a groundwater boom. As it happened elsewhere, the whole groundwater was about to the ground pump and into the small scale system, uh, um, really revitalized the, the bank education system as a whole. How did that happen? I will explain to you in a little while. So, but we, in this study, which Tusha, myself, and a few colleagues of ours did, was a kind of record place and gain, trying to get a kind of first hand first information into capturing the changes that occur, what were the main drivers, and what lessons can this offer to other kind of to the education sector as a whole. So, and we were looking principally at four small time systems, uh, what were the, the technological innovations and the institutional changes that went with it especially with the rise of groundwater. Now, what I would start is my presentation and a small, I give some, some of the, quickly rush through some of the salient features of small banks, then the traditional agrarian systems on the small banks, and what were the drivers of the recent changes, and what were the outcomes of changes, and more importantly, what all these changes offer for the one like public education, large scale public education systems, in India and Sri Lanka and that where it is necessary. So these are my schematic representation of uh, traditional education system. Most of the reference of still are there. It's not exactly like this, but it still captivates most of the essential components of the system. First, it is based on a three-fold system of, uh, of land use. Principally, you have the, the tank and its command area. And you see the Many fields are all parallel to the tax fund for facilitating water management, uh, uh, better water management, also in much more to uh, achieve uh, more egalitarian objectives, which are characteristic of the scale of, of the society. Second component is the chain, I mean, but initially the chain or, or the shipping cultivation, which was in the forest land, that's the, and then the third component is the home scale. This work was a perennial problem. So, what is very important to understand here is that the viability of and the sustainability of the dam depends not only on this component, not only on this component, but only on that component, but all three components. One component alone is not enough. That has implications for uh, the major systems, which I think has largely become much more, uh, has largely become single focus model block systems which have a little room for diversity. Now there have been changes, we don't get the city cultivation anymore and that has become stabilized uplands. And in the and uh, and besides the physical feature that I just described, you have a system of institutional environment that is necessarily based on the principle of egalitarian and also uh, uh, charity, reciprocity and the whole question of moral economy comes in. And of course, you have a highly differentiated property rights and an elaborate system of community management that goes with it. And these things, as I said, they were on, really, uh, on the decline till, till about 10 years ago, and then there has been this groundwater boom. The groundwater, unlike in one, uh, other parts, major parts, in, that you see here, it occurred not in the education canal command area, but in the uplands in the areas which we call the and it was here this the many times remain intact and this is where the uh, the, the rock water uh, rock water rock water was occurring and it was kind of spontaneous farmer driven uh, investments and this is in the villages that we studied, this was a kind of the groundwater, the drinking groundwater, established a groundwater boom that has happened in all over the in these villages. And the weather is very high, and these were again in the village clusters that we have studied. 
what we see with this study, the distribution of these uh, uh, these uh, microwaves of the North Pole, we see that these are the different classes of land, the predominantly the cold field, the upper-related the corridor, the uh, upper-related the acre field, which was subsequently less than the mines with the population increases, we know the land area on the kind of population. And then this is the same where the other changes of the weather, we have to be very changes of the was in other sanitary compartments. And this is this is all state property. That's not important. This is not private property. Runavilla, after uh, private property, Kungan is a private property. This is both these are in the uh, common property that can belong to the village. So there is large scale enclosure of these lands to foster uh, anybody who has capital can enclose the land and so far the government group after to that area. And with the groundwater group, we see so many other changes. We had a system that was focused primarily on a penny, a penny calculation was the people around the army system, and the little bit of energy calculation on the city calculation, the other crops were grown. You see that the rules have changed, and then the upland became much more important than the penny. So there is some kind of historical reference by an anthropologist called the Beach work who started monitoring that we saw that these changes that were occurring <coughs> back even in the 50s when he started studying that the gradual transition where the shifting cultivation of after plots, after rainfall plots from one in one to cash income from the land cultivation. So you can see the kind of diversity that will occur as a result of the world of with from paddy much more intensive cultivation of, uh, um, of vegetables, and so vegetables and then there is product cultivation and more important is there is uh, production for the market. Now what these changes, uh, as a result of these changes, we compare the public intensity in these locations between <coughs> the uh, between uh, the paddy fields and the upland and we see that the Cropping intensity increases as a result of the long run boom from in those very all locations. Now this is only increase in one of the locations, that is one of the proposals where it is the other uh, component of this one and farming system. Secondly, there was then the started going for marketing, and the marketing was before it was in the nearby town and subsequently they became uh, more into the wholesale markets and much in the food as the nation of the That's very interesting way of organizing market. So that's the third chain that has occurred of substance production to market oriented production. I have another 20 minutes, I guess, right? Two minutes. Two minutes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so this I think I will not go through, uh, go through quickly. And what I see is what I mentioned earlier with this rise. Um, so the most important transformation that occurred was the institutional transformation that was over time that has been a change in the institution from the colonial era, the very dark system, which was a water master, then after the independence that we had a whole series of changes of committees to what what farm organizations. And then of course the farm organizations like what we hear about everywhere were not performing very well. But then, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, the government to more, not more by uh, all of my accident plan to deliberate design, channel the fertilizer subsidy schemes through the water use association. So the FA became uh, an authority that was responsible for channeling the water uh, subsidy, and that gave them enormous powers to enable them to be possible. To get the subsidy, you have to be a member of the water association, and to get the subsidy, you have to have the stamp of the water use authority, the water use association president, saying that he's a member, he has paid his membership fee, and all those things, and so on. So this became a kind of instrument where he has mobilized the support of the membership to perform uh, whatever function that the water use association has. So that's the have to say, look at that, and we run, have only half a minute probably now. So I'm not going to just conclude this session by saying some of the general stresses. First is, we shall look at what are the farmer led initiatives. This is one of the farming led initiatives of revitalizing their own systems. There was no public investment and they revitalized it the way they wanted it. And the focus is on the uh, and it was an induced uh, change 
brought about both technical and spiritual intervention. And then the induced, and this inducement was because of the absorbing the the capacity of mediated drive. And it was an agricultural terrace in the, in the advanced systems that was affected by the fluid ocean. So, what was happened is that these dangers were brought about <coughs> because the small scale system was community based and they had both the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the digital configuration and the institutional configuration uh, arrangement that were, that lent itself to change. But as you contrast that with the main scheme, the main scheme is rigid. The physical layout is rigid, the state is rigid, the public systems are fixed, the canal system fixed, if somebody else takes the decision. So you have the rigidity, and the, uh, whereas in, this, uh, in the small scale system, you have the flexibility to change. So, that's said the president. Uh, the key lesson for this is that in order to revitalize this large scale system, a peacemaker effort is, is not low. What you need to do is take a holistic approach. That means every component of the large scale system has to be done. You can't do it here, here, and there, it doesn't work. If we might as well spread to you, take a few selected, completely rehabilitate the physical design, the institutional organizations, and the uh, uh, even the public system, which has to be modernized. And you can't go back to monocrop systems, the farmers are not to, not to do that for very long. And then I think it also that we see too much emphasis on the whole question of education piece. And I think we started at very early in uh, trying to get an education piece from farmers. And they're still trying to struggle with it. Change, start, we started at very early trying to organize farmers into water resources. They're still struggling with it. So what I just want to say is, this conclude by saying is that we need a much more holistic approach that we can see the lesson, the successes that we see in the small scale system is because they have taken a holistic approach with a much more flexibility and are flexible to change. Thank you. Thank you.